I want to talk to you about dedicating a place. Dedicating a place for God in your life and in your schedule and in your thoughts, in your time. As a Christian, we don't want to just put God at the end of the hall in a closet. We want to give him the best place in our house and in our life. And that's very important. Uh, in the scripture, 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 8 will be our text for today. I want to set the stage. We're about to talk about a man named Elisha. And he was the protege of a man named Elijah. Elijah was a man of God. And if you lived in those days and you weren't right with God, you were scared of Elijah. Elijah had the ability to pray and cause the heavens to close where there was no rain. He also had the ability to pray again and God sent the rain. So here's a guy that had enough faith to even control the weather. Um, he also had the ability to call down fire from heaven. He had the faith to believe for God to, call, to, to send fire from heaven. He built an altar and the prophets of Baal tried to call down fire and he made fun of them. He's like, hey, is your God going to the bathroom? Is he on vacation? Why isn't he answering? And then Elijah prayed a simple prayer and fire came down from heaven. He had so much fun doing that that a couple of years later, some people came to attack him, some soldiers, and he just called down fire from heaven on them. And um, how many of you would like that ability to just call fire? No, just play. You don't know what spirit you're off. So we're talking about a man of God of extreme faith, and he had a protege named Elisha. Now, Elisha didn't walk in half the power of Elijah. He walked in double the power of Elijah. He had the double portion. When Elijah went to heaven, he passed the mantle down to Elisha, and the Bible records that Elijah did eight miracles. I'm sure that God used him to do so much more than that, but that's what the Bible recorded. In Elisha, the Bible records 16. So it's an exact double of the, the anointing and the power on Elisha's life. Elisha had just stepped into his ministry, and you have to know this, that Elisha walked around Israel as somewhat of a celebrity, because when God's presence is on somebody's life to that degree, and people are healed, the dead are raised, and Elisha could hear God's voice with such sensitivity that invading armies were scared of him because he would know what they were saying in their private chambers by the Spirit of God. And he would tell the king of Israel, this is their plans. So even in the surrounding nations, people were scared of Elisha. So Elisha carried a lot of weight. He carried the, the mantle of a man of God. And so if he were to come to your house, it was such an extreme honor such a privilege to be able to host him. And so we're going to read the story of a woman that you may know as the Shunammite woman who opened up her house for the presence of God to be there. She opened up a house, her house for Elisha. Now watch it in 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 8. One day Elisha went to the town of Shunam, a wealthy woman. I love the fact that God can use poor, and wealthy, it doesn't matter your place in life, but a wealthy woman lived there and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She must have cooked a really good meal that first time, and Elisha just said, hey, do you mind if I stop by when I come back through? And so they made a regular occurrence. Elisha would swing past the town of Shunem to pick up some enchiladas, you know? And uh, so she said to her husband, I'm sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. So let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. So the rest of this story, it's, it's somewhat lengthy, but I'll tell it to you instead of read it to you. Elisha appreciated the fact that she built a home for him. And so instead of just visiting, he actually began to stay there. One day he told his servant, they've done so much for us go ask her to come here. And so the woman came and he said, do you have any needs? What can I do for you? Would you like me to put in a good word to the king or to the army commander? And I love that she doesn't have any ambition. She said, no, sir, I'm good. I'm blessed and I'm good. And so she went away and Elisha was still 
wanting to do something nice for us. So he asked the servant, what doesn't she have? She has all of this other stuff. She has things. What doesn't she have? And the servant said, she doesn't have a son. So Elisha said, call her back. And she came and uh, stood at the doorway of the room that she had prepared for him. And he said, around this time next year, you will have a son. And she began to cry. And she said, don't mess with me. Don't you mess with me. She really did say that. She said, don't mess with me. And he said, I'm not messing with you. You'll see that it comes true. And she conceived. A year later, she had a child. We can stop right there and just already recognize that when you dedicate a space for God, that the deepest desires of your heart, the things that are hidden, that money can't buy, things can't buy, you have in your life, the blessing of God. What if she hadn't have made a room for Elisha? Let's just say, what if she hadn't have provided that? She probably would have never had a son. But she made room for God in her life. She made a space, she dedicated a space, and because of that, now she has what she couldn't have, which was a son. Well, time went on, and you fast forward a few years later, the boy was out working with his dad, harvesting wheat, and he began to cry, my head, my head. They brought him back home, and around noontime, he died. So this is what the mom does. She takes the boy and brings him to the bed in the room that she had prepared a place for God, laid him on the bed that she had built. Then she got a donkey and began to ride to go find Elisha. The servant of Elisha saw her coming and ran to meet her. And he said, what can we do for you? And she said, nothing. I want to see Elisha. She didn't want to talk to the servant. She wanted to talk to the man. And so she got to Elisha, and, and the Bible says that she fell down at his feet, and she said, I told you not to mess with me. And he knew instantly what she was talking about. So he gave his staff to his servant, and he said, quickly, ride to her house and lay the staff on the boy's body. And she said, that's not good enough. I want you to come. So Elisha, because she had cooked enchiladas and because she had made a place for him at, her, at his house, I mean, I don't know if Elisha would have gone around the country just for anybody, but this woman had made a place for God in her home. And so Elisha sent the staff, but then he followed behind. What happened next was they brought the staff to the young man and laid the staff on him and nothing happened. So the servant ran back to Elisha while he was on his way there and said, the boy's still dead. Thank God the woman had enough insight to realize the staff wasn't going to cut it. She needed Elisha to come. So Elisha walks into the room and Elisha lays on top of the boy, put his hands on his hands and his face on his face, lays on top of him. The Bible says that the boy's body began to get warm. So Elisha stood up and watched Nothing happened. So Elisha paced back and forth, and then a second time got on the boy and did the same thing. The boy coughed seven times. Elisha picks him up, brings him to the mom, and now he was alive. So not only did she get a miracle that she couldn't get unless she would have uh, made a place for God, but God also raised her son from the dead. So she's experiencing the miraculous power of God because she has dedicated a place for God. Let's rewind. What if, she had, what if she had never prepared a place for God? She wouldn't have a son, and she wouldn't have seen the power of God to raise the dead. One more story, and then I'll give you those blanks. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 10. David wants the Ark of the Covenant in his house, because wherever God's presence is, the blessing of God is. He knew that if I get God's presence in my house, I will be invincible. I will have the wisdom of God. I will be blessed. And so he wanted God's presence in his house, but he didn't follow God's way and his rules. And uh, you can go read the story later, but they had an accident and they had to put the ark in a man's home. They were going down a street and they just picked the closest house to where the accident happened. And so David knocked on the door, said, can I put the ark in your house? And Obed-Edom said, sure. 
And he opened up his house. They brought the ark in. Now, this is the same ark that was in the Holy of Holies. And if you would walk in the Holy of Holies and you were unworthy that several hundred years before, you would die. So this was a very joyous moment and a very scary moment. What if they knocked on your door with the ark of the covenant and said, can we park this in the living room? Would it change what you watch on Netflix? <laughs> you better believe it would. If you had to look past the Ark of the Covenant to watch that television, you would just throw it in the garbage. But that's the reality of what's happened in your life. God's come to dwell in you. But let's read what happened. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 10. So David decided not to move the Ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The Ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom in his entire household. Some Jewish scholars say that he was so blessed that people from all over Israel traveled just to get close to the house in a, month, in, in a three month period of time. What am I saying? Big point here is if you will dedicate a place for God in your time, in your schedule, in your thought life, if you will dedicate a place for God, he will fill that place. And when he fills that place, you will experience the blessing of God in every area of your life. You will begin to notice a difference in your family, in your marriage, in your relationships with your kids, in your success at jobs, in your wisdom that's in your life. You're gonna notice a difference when you just prepare a place for God in your life. I remember before I was married, those were some sad days, some lonely, sad days. My brother Joel and I lived together, and maybe you've heard me tell this before, but Joel liked it cold. And Joel would put the air condition on 62 degrees. And if you have a home in a thermostat, you know that's cold. I've been to some of your houses, and it's like 83 degrees. And um, you probably need to turn it below 80. But... We would have ours at 62, and I was just cold all the time. I'd walk in the house, and I would be cold. And our house, it, it felt cold. It also wasn't that clean. And there was leftover pizza hanging around on the, 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 the island and uh, food in the, in the sink, and our beds weren't made. And every month, for the first six months that we lived together after we moved out of our parents' house, the electricity was cut off. You know why it was cut off? Because we didn't pay the bill. It took us a while to learn that, you know, electricity doesn't just happen. It comes from somewhere. And they charge you for it. So every month it got cut off. I mean, life was tough. We'd come home and the lights were off and we'd flick them and wonder if the light bulbs had gone out. And, oh, it was rough. No paintings on the wall. No artwork, no mirrors. You know, it's just a bad situation. And at the time, my grandmother on my dad's side, uh, Pastor Roy's wife, who they founded this church in 1963, she passed a few years ago, but she would come over to our house and while we were gone, she'd make a point to come while we were gone. And uh, she would clean. She'd clean our sheets, make our beds, clean the dishwasher. I mean, just do the things that only a good grandma will do. <laughs> and so we would come home and everything was clean. And, and we would know that it was Mimi. We called her Mimi. We'd go to the refrigerator and open the door to the refrigerator. And she would always leave a chocolate pie in the refrigerator, kind of as a cherry on top that says, only I could have done this. And so <laughs> we would know it was her because of the chocolate pie in the refrigerator. And although we appreciated those visits, there was a distinction between being visited and then somebody actually living in our house that could do that kind of thing. It wasn't until a few years later that Angie moved into my house. And I remember when Angie was visiting and her, her older sister, they would come over to our house. And one night in particular, they came over and they cooked a meal. And this was before Angie and I were dating or anything. But I remember that night being the night that I was like, I got to marry this one. <laughs> she looked so beautiful and they cooked an amazing meal. And I was love struck. And so the story would go that few months later, Angie and I would begin to date, and then we got married. Well, when she came to 
live in my house, not to just visit my house, but when she came to live in my house, things started to change dramatically. At the time, I still had Snoopy sheets. <laughs> Why not? If you ever go to a bachelor's pad, I mean, it just doesn't matter. Whatever sheets are around are going on the bed. So I had some Snoopy sheets and some G.I. Joe sheets. And I'm just kidding. I didn't have G.I. Joe. <laughs> but I did have some Snoopy sheets. And I had a, a camouflage comforter. So Snoopy sheets, a camouflage comforter. And this thing was about this thick because I needed it because it was Arctic temperatures in my room. And the only thing I had on the wall was a stuffed bass that I had caught a few years before. And that bass was on the wall. That was my pride and joy. That was the only artwork in the whole house. So when Angie came to live in my house, she said, the bass has got to go. Snoopy has to leave. The comfort has got to go. The AC has to change. I'm like, what is going on around here? And then she began to paint the walls. And then artwork started to go up. And I'd come home and just things were different. And uh, I just noticed that there was a massive difference between a visitation and a habitation. Many Christians live in the world of visitation, where they just want God to visit them. They say, Lord, if you just visit us. And people come to church and just say, Lord, visit me now. Or in a moment of crisis, visit me now. Visit, visit, visit. I have beautiful news for you. He doesn't want to just visit you. He wants to inhabit you. He wants you to become his home. That's point number one. Decide you want to move from visitation to habitation. The woman at Shunem got the revelation. Yeah, I'm cooking enchiladas and he's passing through. And that has limited benefits. But if I really want the blessing of God, it's going to come when I dedicate a place and I say, come and just stay here. Religion is satisfied to have a visitation mentality. I'll come to church once every other week, and that's when I'll do my Jesus thing. But a true Christian that wants to press in deeper says, i got to have a habitation. I've got to be a Monday morning uh, habitation, a Monday night habitation. i gotta, I got to have God come and live inside. And guys, when he comes to live inside, he says, take the bass down. Take the Snoopy sheets off. Kick the air up. Let's beautify this house that looks so ugly. And your anger starts to disappear. Your bitterness and your unforgiveness starts to disappear. And he begins to put up the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace. And you begin to experience the blessing of God in your life because God is not visiting. He is living. There's a difference between a live in God and a visit God. When he comes to live in your house, it's totally different. Now, and, you know, you think about your life, the type person that you'll have to come over to your house for supper is different than the type person you'll have to come and stay. I don't have to know you that good for you to come to my house and eat supper. But we have to get a little bit closer for me to say, kick your shoes off. You have refrigerator rights. Here's the remote control in the bedrooms upstairs. There's a, there's a distinction. God wants to come and make his home in you. He wants to kick his shoes off. He wants to say, this place is holy because I'm here. You are now holy because I am here. I live in you. I'm here tomorrow morning. I'm here tomorrow night. I'm here Tuesday morning, Tuesday night. I'm with you at your job. I'm with you everywhere. I don't want to just visit you. I want to dwell in you, dwell with you. This is the good news, though, that God does dwell in you as a believer. But a lot of times we act like he's not there and we push him to the end of the hall and, and God wants to say, be aware of my dwelling. Be aware that I'm present in your life. John chapter 14 and verse 23, look at this verse. Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. One more passage, Ephesians 3 and verse 17. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. God wants to make his home in you. And so just like the Shunammite woman, you have to decide today, I'm gonna move from a visitation to a habitation mentality. Bethany, listen to me. 
if you get a hold of this revelation that God wants to dwell in me and he wants me to be a place that he can call home, it will change your life. This is the difference between religion and relationship. Religion says do this, go there, do that, and all this stuff. Relationship says live, abide, dwell, habitate in me, this vessel. So make that decision today. I'm going to be a habitation Christian, not a visitation Christian. Second thing that we see from this passage is that she didn't just dedicate a place. She dedicated the best place. I think to really experience the blessing of God in the way that the Shunammite woman experienced it, you got to make up in your mind that he's not just going to get a place, but he's going to get the best place. Not the end of the hall closet. Let me explain. She said, let's build an upstairs room. Now, if only wealthy people had upstairs rooms in those days, they didn't have the type of construction we did. Uh, we do. They had very different type of construction to where if, if you lived in those times, rarely did anybody have upstairs, and, but they were wealthy enough to have an upstairs. The thing that was so great about upstairs is it wasn't dirty because downstairs, all the dust from the roads was downstairs, but when you went upstairs, it was clean. Also, upstairs, the ventilation through the upstairs room was so much better than downstairs. And so it was cooler, it was cleaner, and it just was the best. In your life and in your Christianity, you really do have to always stay vigilant that you keep God in the best place of your life. What does that mean? It means don't give him the remaining part of your day after you've done everything else that you find more valuable than him. And you know, the tough thing is so many people say, man, my life is so busy. I got, you know, I got to get up and go to work. I'm working two jobs just to feed the kids and just to do all this stuff. And you know, I know God understands. But I would just challenge you. What happens if you put him first and he recognizes that through all of the stuff that you feel responsible for, you still value him more than all of that and you still will dedicate the most precious place to him. I promise you that two jobs will turn to one job. You're going to see more money, less time because when God comes to dwell in a place, the blessing just comes. And so I'm challenging you to stop limiting God to the end of the hallway in the closet and say, I'm going to prepare the best place for him. That means in your time. It also means in your thought life. Many of us think about our bills. We think about our kids. We think about our work. We think about all kinds of stuff, our relational problems, our physical problems. But what if you gave the best of your thoughts to God? You carved out time, place, and you just said, God, I'm just going to dwell on you for this precious part of my day. You prepare the very best for him. Look at David's passion, Psalm chapter 132. This is David writing a song. He said, I made a solemn promise to the Lord. He vowed to the mighty one of Israel, I will not go home. I will not let myself rest. I will not let my eyes sleep nor close my eyelids in slumber until I find a place to build a house for the Lord. I got to make room for him. I got to make a place for him, a sanctuary for the mighty one of Israel. You should not allow yourself to sleep, slumber, think about other stuff until you found where am I putting my time with God? Where am I clearing out a place for him? I want you to see in Jesus's life how passionately he cared about the place of God. There's only one time where Jesus got violent. There's only one time where he kicked some tail. He got a bullwhip and went into the temple, and one man drove hundreds of merchants out. I mean, he, pro he put his son of God face on on that time, you know. He, he, he scared them. I don't know how one man drove all of those merchants out, but I'm telling you, it wasn't sissy. There was nothing sissy about it. It was kicking butt. He got in there and just started slinging and, and clearing, cleaning out the temple, preparing a place. And he said, my father's house will be a house of prayer. Get out of here. And the disciples acknowledged. They said, 
the word prophesied about him that zeal for God's place, house, would consume him. He cared about God's place. How passionate are you about God's place, about preparing a place? Like David, would you say, I won't give sleep into my eyes until I found where his place is in my life and in my time. Interesting thought, and then we move to point three, is that Jesus never prayed without a place. You read the Gospels. When he prayed, there was a place. It says that he would go into the wilderness, or he would go to a secluded place, or he would go on top of the mountain, but there was always a place. God wants a place in your life. He wants a place in your schedule. The third thought that I want to extract from this passage about the blessing of God is that you need to experience the blessing of God's habitation. When God comes into your life, you're gonna experience the blessing in four areas. I don't think anything in the Bible is accidental. Maybe the gene genealogies, but outside of that, everything is intentional. No, I'm just kidding. The genealogies are even great. They're just a little bit boring to read, and I can't pronounce any of them. Maybe one day God will show me the revelation of those genealogies. But these four articles that she built, she said, we're gonna prepare a place, and I'm gonna build a bed, a chair, a table, and a lamp. What did those things represent? When she was inviting God's presence into her house, she was expecting to experience four things. First is the bed, which is, that represents the rest of God. When you move from visitation to habitation, God comes to live inside of you, you're gonna be fearless, you're gonna be courageous, and you're gonna have a divine sense of rest that comes on your life. You're not gonna be scared about next month. You're not gonna be scared about dying. You're not gonna be scared of cancer or getting in a car wreck or you're just not going to be scared because even if it comes at you, you have the all powerful ones on the inside of you. And if your physical body dies, you're going to keep living on and on and on. So you're not scared. The world is scared right now. They are scared. You got people hoarding bags of rice and getting guns and getting ready to bunker in for the last apocalypse. I want to challenge you to live courageous, live fearless. Say, you know what? I'm going to shine brighter for Jesus in this moment than ever before. Don't let eternity have a record of me being scared to death in the final days when it was the most important time for me to shine brightly for Jesus. You need to be focused on, am I loving people? Do they sense the love of Jesus flowing through me? Are people being ushered into the kingdom? Are people being converted? You're scared, am I gonna have enough food and water? I gotta go to my shelter and get in here and uh. And there are people here that are like that. I know that. And you're mad at me right now. You're like, man, he needs to be preaching it. We got to go out into the hills and get our stuff and get them. But you don't have any love. You're mean. You hadn't won somebody to Jesus in the last 15 years. You need to say, the greater one is on the inside of me. This is our finest hour. I'm going to preach louder than I've ever preached. You say, where are you getting that? God told me. God said, this is how I want you to respond in these last days. I want you to preach louder than you've ever preached. I want you to love harder than you've ever loved. I want people to see the light of Jesus shine brighter than ever. That's how I respond. That's how we're going to respond. But the rest of God. I could talk about that forever, but God is inviting you into his peace. He's inviting you into his rest. You're not gonna be scared of, of, of people wanting to kill you or, 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 or horrible things happening around you. The, the shootings that just happened in Oregon. You know, I, I was so blessed reading the testimonies yesterday of these people that when he held the gun up to his head, their head and he said, are you a Christian? They said, yes, I am. Boom, he would shoot them. No, none of them denied it. Every one of them said, yes, I am. Boom. Yes, I am. Boom. What would happen to you? Is the greater one living on the inside of you to that degree to where you would say, kill my body. It doesn't matter. I'm immortal. Okay. This is for people that are not saved. This is crazy talk. I understand that. 
But this is the gospel that we preach. The greater one lives on the inside of us and his rest has filled our hearts. I wanna, the second thing that she was hoping to experience was seen in the chair. The chair represents fellowship, the fellowship of God. When God moves from visitation to habitation, you will experience conversation. I believe for all of you that God wants to take you from a one-way Christianity, Christianity to a two-way Christianity where there's conversation and communion. And Come, let us talk. Let's have a meal as friends. Revelation chapter three, verse 20. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. He wants to fellowship. Now this chair, you know, I think about our, our family. When Angie and I got married, she would come over to our house and she would say, you know what, you guys do some stuff that's weird. And I didn't know they were weird till we got married. But on a Sunday afternoon, and after this service, this is what I'm gonna do. We go over to my parents' house, and my mom's cooking spaghetti right now. And I'm gonna go over to, to her house, and our whole family comes over, and after we have a meal, we go into a room that they call the sunroom. And we can sit there for hours and talk. And so somebody will tell a joke. We all laugh. Then somebody will tell a story. And we'll sit there. We'll talk about you. We'll talk about the church. Have you, did you see such and such today? Did you see? We'll talk about everything for hours and hours. The sun will go down and we'll still be talking. And my wife thought that was so bizarre when we got married. She's like, who does that? And then then she got into it too, and now we all just sit around and talk. <laughs> I feel that that's missing in a lot of American homes and American culture is the dialogue and the fellowship. That's why a lot of families don't make it is there's no conversation, there's no fellowship, there's no communion. It's just, and when they do sit down, somebody's watching the TV on the loudest setting that it can go on, and all everybody else has their phone out looking at Facebook and Instagram. Nobody's talking, and if they do talk, it's to say, hey, did you see that video on Facebook? I'll forward it to you. But no fellowship. What would it be like in the natural world if you got committed more to conversations and fellowships and when you go on date nights, put your phone down, leave your phones in the car and say, we're going to have conversation. It might be tough at first because you realize we hadn't talked in a long time. But what would it be like if you committed to that fellowship? And then with God, a lot of our Christianity doesn't involve conversations with God. It's things we do. It's we just Christianity to us is, did I go to church? Did I maybe read the Bible? you know, once at least this week, or it's these things we do. And God wants conversation. He wants fellowship. The only way fellowship happens is if you will be still and know that he's God and say, God, I have dedicated this place for our conversation. I'm sitting in this chair because I want to hear your voice. And I'm going to sit here until I hear your voice. And if I don't, it's okay. I'll be here tomorrow. That is moving from visitation to habitation. It's saying, I want the conversation. And guys, God wants that with you. Your Christianity would be so powerful if you get that concept. The third thing is she built a table. The table represents the sustenance of God. It represents the bread. When God comes to live inside of you, your spirit is gonna be fed. How important is it that your spirit is fed? Well, let me ask you this. How many of you ate breakfast this morning? Okay, how many of you drank water at least once today? Okay, that's because you don't ignore your physical body, ever, ever. You're gonna go day. You're not gonna go days without feeding your physical body, but your spirit, man. When you become born again, and I want please catch this, all the way at the South Campus back row. You have to hear this. If you don't know Jesus, you don't have a living spirit. All you are is a body and a soul without a living spirit. 
But when Jesus comes into your life, and he's the only one that has the power to do this, he breathes and your spirit becomes what we call born again. It is now living and it has the ability to communicate with God. Before Jesus, you have no way to even talk to God. God is a spirit and your spirit's dead. But when you get born again, you become born again. I mean, your spirit becomes alive and now you have a living spirit. But that spirit is an infant. And if you starve it, don't give it bread, don't give it water, don't give it anything, then your flesh is gonna be what dictates your life. Your sexual desires, your physical desires, your body will be the loudest voice that you hear. It will say, feed me, drink, have sex, do stuff that just animals do. But when that spirit man is fed and strong and nourished, it will flip to where your spirit man actually begins to tell everything in your life what to do. And I love Dr. Caroline Leaf last week. She said, as your spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit, submitted to the Holy Spirit, that is the the channel to life. Holy Spirit, spirit, soul, body. Body just gets told what to do. So the table, she was desiring to have the sustenance of God. And when he comes to live inside of you, your spirit gets strong. Then the final thing that she built was a lamp. I think that this represents the Holy Spirit's inspiration in our life, his presence, but this is the inspiration of God. The reason she wrote, put a lamp there is because she knew that he would need to write, that God would inspire him and that he would need to write. And only people that are writing in those days would have a lamp because at nighttime when they were inspired, they would write and early in the morning they would write. She put a lamp there because she wanted inspiration to come from her home. She wanted the inspiration of God to come out of her home. What does this mean for you and I? When God makes his habitation in you and when you dedicate a place, expect the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What that means is you're gonna be inspired by his voice to write, you'll be inspired by him to purchase a property, to do a business deal, to start a company. You're gonna be inspired by his voice to do things, to create things. I, if I had a gift, it would be to songwrite. Songwriting comes as natural to me as anything, as a painter painting a piece of art. That's what God has given me. And, but that by itself is an empty carcass But when God comes to live and dwell and habitate in me, he begins to breathe songs through me and inspire songs through me. And I'm telling you, if you will allow your life to be a habitation for God, you're gonna be inspired. And you can't, you gotta be careful not to give yourself the credit in those moments because it's not because of you. It's because his spirit lives in you. You're not that smart. But hey, when he comes to live inside of you, his inspiration comes. And you're going to be inspired. And the whole world is going to see. I love this about Jesus' disciples. They were fishermen and tax collectors. But when they opened their mouth and spoke in Acts, it says that the Sanhedrin scratched their heads and said, aren't these ordinary men? How is it that they speak with such wisdom? It's because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You're going to say things that are smarter than you. And you're going to say, whoa, did I say that? <laughs> can, I, can I give you a little bit behind the scenes in my life? Just a little b- back door. This past Thursday, I was preparing to preach this weekend. And I wanted to speak on the power of praise, the power of corporate praise. And I had it already. And before I began to type out the outlines that you receive. The Holy Spirit just told me, hold on, wait. And I said, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say? And he said, look at the life of the Shunammite. I went to the Shunammite woman. And then he began to point out these different articles. And, and this was his word. It's not mine. And, and, but when he lives in you, he says, he does. You look at Daniel and the wisdom that Daniel had, that Joseph had. So you need God to dwell if you dedicate a place. But here, I'll close with this. The most beautiful part about this whole passage is 
that God gave her a legacy. So you tap into his inspiration, you tap into his rest, you tap into his nourishment, all that stuff, but you tap into legacy. Watch this. You don't have any ability to make eternal significance without God helping you. And so if you live your life without him living inside of you, your life is meaningless, worthless, and there is no hope for any legacy eternally. Your life is gonna be only as good as that gravestone that says your name and the dates that you live. But when you say, God, come, dwell, I dedicate a place, to, then you'll have a legacy. She didn't have a son before, but because she made a place, God gave her a son and gave her a legacy. If you want a legacy in your life, Say, I'm not going to be a visitation Christian. I'm going to be a habitation Christian that says every day, all day, he's here and he's welcome. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for Bethany's Weekend Experience. We hope that you were encouraged and challenged during the message. If you made a decision to follow Christ or maybe you've rededicated your life to the Lord, we want to encourage you to tell someone about it. Tell your family, a friend, and feel free to tell us about it by clicking the Talk About It button on our homepage. If you need prayer for anything else, just go to our homepage and click Request Prayer button. We'd love to have you join us or come visit one of our four campuses for a live worship experience. We hope you had a great day and we'll see you next time.